Odessa by Mickey Fisher. Odessa Reef Base was 180 miles west of the Philippine Islands and 300 meters below the surface. It was built by a marine biologist named Emma Honoré, nicknamed Mother Ocean for her love of the sea. She made a series of films in her 30s that inspired a whole generation of explorers, people like my dad. The seas are the lifeblood of humankind, she would say, reminding us that life on Earth began there. And yet, we have better maps of Mars than we do of our own oceans. Dr. Honoré built the underwater research lab near a series of thermal vents, a place she believed was the origin for all life on Earth. After her wife and partner Alice passed away, Emma started spending more and more time down there, going weeks without human contact. She began to hear voices, thinking somehow Alice was reaching out to her from beyond the grave. Eventually, she suffered a complete breakdown and had to be rescued. When they found her, she was on the floor of an airlock, losing oxygen minutes from death. After that, Emma's family turned Odessa over to an undersea regulatory organization, who in turn leased out sections to interested parties, of which there was no shortage. On one side, there were marine geologists from the Pinnacle Mining Corporation, salivating over the billions of dollars worth of precious metals located around the vents. On the other side, there was my dad, Evan Oakes, one of Dr. Honoré's most devoted followers. She hired him for his very first expedition out of grad school, and he paid her back with decades of service. When she was forced to retire, he picked up her cause. He spent the last two years cataloging as many new species as he could before the mining inevitably brought about their extinction. But time and funding were running out. Pinnacle was on the verge of a major extraction. The end was coming. I took the yellow submersible they called Ringo down to Odessa to spend the last two weeks of my summer vacation from college. I followed in my dad's footsteps my freshman year, majoring in marine biology. Midway through the first semester, I hit a wall. After a lifetime of being dragged around the world from one boat to another, living in cramped quarters and fighting off seasickness, I decided to follow my passion instead. Ever since I was a kid, I loved taking things apart and putting them back together. Electronic things. So I changed my major to computer science. There was just one big problem. I still hadn't told my dad. He had big plans for us after my graduation. We were gonna open our own submersible design firm and travel the world testing them out. After my mom passed away, all we had was each other. He would never say it, but I knew he was having a hard time letting go. It was my last day before going back to the surface and I still hadn't worked up the courage to tell him my plan. I knew it was going to break his heart. That morning, he woke me up like he did when I was in middle school, blasting classic rock over the portable speaker in my quarters. His dad used to wake him up exactly the same way, so it was kind of a family tradition. I hauled myself up and saw him standing in the doorway, grinning ear to ear, wearing his uniform, Pendleton flannel shirt, sleeves rolled up, dive master's watch, three days worth of stubble. It was the same every day. It didn't matter if he was climbing into a submersible or giving a speech on the TED stage. He said, Last day, thought we'd go for a drive. I pulled up the shade that covered my porthole window, just in time to see a school of manta rays glide by, silhouetted by work lights, sleek and fast, like a fleet of dark angels. I was sick of the ocean, but I had to admit, that kind of thing never got old. As I slipped on my shoes, an object on the floor caught my eye, a shiny gold coin. It was part of a game I was playing with my friend, Rick. I knew he was hiding somewhere nearby, but I didn't let on. I just pocketed the coin and looked for a place to hide it near the edge of the moon pool on my way to the galley. Rick would find it at some point during the day and bring it back. Rick was a worthy opponent. Oh, <laughs> he was also an octopus. My father's research assistant, Vadim, had found him injured and took him in for rehabilitation. 
He turned out to be a gifted escape artist and a master of disguise. He loved to move around Odessa, camouflaged and undetected, and knew every inch of the base. Every day when I passed his aquarium, I would stop and feed him some shrimp. One day I noticed a coin embedded in the gravel floor of his tank, so I fished it out and put it on Vadim's desk. And that's how the game began. I had no idea it would eventually mean the difference between life and death. Odessa was shaped like a starfish, with a center hub that housed the various labs. From there, arms branched out containing the crew quarters, the galley, the moon pool, the observation pod, and the docking station for the submersibles. The various sections were connected by tight corridors, segmented by airlocks that could be sealed in case of a breach. Between the hum of the generators and the smell of salt water, it was like living in a cross between a space station and an aquarium. I made my way through the circular corridors to the galley, where Gordon Yorkie, the pinnacle mining rep, was yelling at his laptop while shoving spoonfuls of oatmeal into his mouth. He was on a Skype call thanks to the umbilical that snaked up to the surface and allowed us to communicate with the outside world. But I don't need them Friday, I need them Monday. Every day you're late cost me $400,000. Gordon loved to talk dollar amounts, especially around my dad. It was a way to rub it in. He saw my dad as an ideologue, and my dad saw him as a sellout. When you put big personalities and big egos in a confined space like Odessa, there's bound to be a little tension. By the time I got there, the place was a powder keg waiting to blow. Gordon's assistant, May, was 10 years older than me. She spoke English, but she and Gordon mostly spoke Cantonese. It didn't seem like he liked her all that much, but she was connected to his investors back in China. Sometimes, we weren't quite sure who was the boss and who was the assistant. Looking back, that should have been a red flag. I grabbed a granola bar and a Red Bull and headed to the bio lab where my dad and Gordon were waiting, holding the cockpit, a pair of gloves with controls and sensors connected to a virtual reality type headset. The cockpit was how you piloted the remote operated vehicle, the small submersible drone he used for his research. In our spare time, we used the rover to explore the various shipwrecks in the area, crossing each one off of a map hanging over my dad's desk. We'd already done the Japanese fishing boat, the Spanish galleon, a Filipino personal craft, and a few others. Dad slipped the gloves on my hands and adjusted the straps on the headset. He asked, It's your last hurrah. Where do you want to go? There's only one left. The Dayton was an American World War II patrol boat, far enough down and out that it hadn't been disturbed by diving companies and eco-tourists. This was our great white whale. I could tell Dad was excited. He used to say, Three million shipwrecks on the ocean floor, each one with a story to tell. It's the biggest history museum on the planet. I flicked the switches on the controls, flipped down the visor, and rolled the throttle. I could see from the rover's point of view as it launched from the docking bay where it was parked next to Ringo, four times its size. My dad and Vadim watched the same feed on the desktop monitor. Piloting the rover was my favorite thing about Odessa Base. Not only were you seeing through its eyes, you were hearing the sounds of the ocean through the headphones. You were fully immersed in your surroundings. I glided through schools of milkfish and passed over multicolored dragonettes. At one point, a huge moray eel shot into view, and I was so one with the rover that I literally screamed out loud. Dad reminded me that they only attack when they're cornered. Just give him plenty of space. Once we were inside the Dayton, I piloted the rover past lockers, the names of sailors stenciled on the front. Kowalski, Alvarez, people who lived and died here. I moved forward, gliding by a crack in the hull when my dad yelled for me to stop and go back. I hadn't seen it on the first pass, but when I pulled the rover back, there it was, plain as day. It was an eye, looking right at me through the crack. Not just looking, staring at the rover as if it could see me too. Dad and Vadim were freaking out beside me. Grown men turned into awestruck children. 
Whoa, is that some kind of squid? New species of cephalopod? Whatever it is, it's huge. Look at that eyeball. Eight inches in diameter at least. Sophie, get in closer. Nice and slow. Let's get a better look. I tried to inch forward, but whatever it was jetted away in a flash. Sorry. I don't think that was you. I think there's something... Just then, a shockwave slammed the rover against the wall of the Dayton, and we lost all contact with it. Alarms sounded throughout Odessa base. The synthetic voice of the warning system told us that the shockwave was headed our way. Dad yelled for us to hold on just before it hit. The blast rocked the base of the Odessa on its foundation. Vadim was thrown from his chair and his head bounced off the floor with a thud. Just like that, the alarms ended. The disturbance was over, but our troubles were just beginning. Vadim was on the floor, unconscious and bleeding badly from the wound to his head. Dad sprang into action, grabbing the med kit from under the desk. Calm and cool under pressure, he'd spent half his life preparing for moments like this. I, on the other hand, was not prepared at all. I was staring at the blood on the floor, paralyzed in the aftermath of the chaos when I heard him yell my name. I snapped back to reality and ran over to help him staunch the bleeding. We managed to get Vadim stabilized, but he was still unconscious. While we were tending to Vadim, Gordon and May ran a systems check. Gordon briefed my dad on what they found. Volcanic eruption. We took a pretty bad hit. How bad? The umbilical was severed for starters. We can't contact the surface? It gets worse. Ringo's docking station was damaged. Launching would breach the airlock and flood the lab, which would be fine if we could get all of us in there. But it only seats two. That means three of us would be left down here to drown or suffocate. Watching from the doorway, I could see the full gravity of our situation land on my dad. We were trapped with no way of calling for help. For a number of years, Odessa was home to teams of astronauts training for missions on board the ISS. Dad loved working alongside them and over time adopted their mantra of working the problem. After cycling through several possible solutions with Gordon and May, he decided the first and best option was to try and repair the umbilical and reestablish communication with the surface. To do that, he'd have to dive out. To dive out, he would need to reach the moon pool where his gear was stashed. Unfortunately, a breach had flooded the corridor leading to the moon pool. That meant he'd have to swim from one end to the other. No suit, no oxygen tank, in freezing cold water. Dad struggled to contain what little breath he had. Midway through the corridor, he glanced up and saw a moray eel racing his way, its razor-sharp teeth on full display. They can take fingers and whole limbs from unlucky divers. Fortunately, my dad rolled out of the way just in the nick of time and avoided the confrontation. With his heart pumping and down to the last few seconds of air in his lungs, he made it to the other side of the corridor and into the moon pool. That was the easy part. Outside, he'd have to contend with limited visibility and roaming bull sharks while doing the delicate work of repairing the umbilical. I couldn't sit still. I had to do something to help. Earlier, when Dad was grabbing the med kit to help Vadim, I noticed an old hard shell case marked Gertrude. It was an underwater telephone the Navy developed back in the 1940s that transmitted high-pitched acoustic waves through water. It's how submarines used to talk to each other. I'd never seen one in real life, and I guessed, correctly, that it was broken, which is why it had been forgotten in the storage compartment in the first place. I pulled it out and dusted it off. It didn't take long to break it down and locate the problem. A couple of rusty coils. I cleaned them up and put them back in place. Then I patched in a mic and my portable speaker. Within seconds, I was able to send out a message. This is Sophie Oakes from Odessa Reef Base. A shockwave took out our line of communication with the surface. We're stranded down here. Can anyone hear me? Hello? I knew it was a long shot, so I waited and tried again. Hello? There was only silence, until a few moments later, I heard a man's voice. It was speaking Tagalog, 
the language of the Filipino natives. May knew enough to understand I was talking to a fisherman. His boat was in distress as well, likely from the same shockwave. I could tell from the shaking in his voice that he was just as worried as I was. We tried to keep the conversation going, but there was some kind of interference, and soon the voice cut out altogether. Dad came back an hour later, bringing his gear and a bit of good news. I patched the umbilical, but it's gonna take a couple of hours for the system to run diagnostics and reboot. We won't know if it's working for a while. Gordon said, Well, we have plenty of oxygen, food, and water. I guess we'll just have to wait it out. A sense of calm finally started to set back in. The worst had passed. Then, a burst of static and another voice broke through the silence. Mayday, mayday, mayday! Lieutenant Alden Kulowski, here! It was coming from Gertrude. Dad looked confused. I explained that I got it working again and had talked to a fishing boat. Dad said, That's an American military ship. There was more static. Then the voice returned. It was a young man in distress, just like us. Just like the fishermen. This is the U.S. S. We are cloud boy, Lieutenant Orofsky. Suddenly, I recognized that name. It was on one of the lockers in the Dayton. As the voice recited the coordinates, Dad tore down the map of the shipwrecks and laid it out on the desk. They lined up exactly with the site of the Dayton. Dad stared in disbelief. That's not possible. The Dayton went down over 75 years ago. Even if they managed to record an SOS, there's no piece of technology that would still be down there broadcasting it. Kowalski's voice stopped again and Gertrude went silent. But the lab wasn't quiet for long. Vadim came to and started mumbling something in his near conscious state, his eyes rolling back in his head. Dad and May ran over to check on him. I watched as he repeated the phrase over and over. I didn't know he spoke Spanish. Dad said, He doesn't. I only remembered a little from high school, so the repetition was helpful. I could tell he was reciting a prayer, asking God to forgive his sins. And then he said a word that I'd seen dozens of times over the past two weeks. He went into convulsions, and May helped Dad get Vadim stabilized. For a geologist's assistant, she knew her way around a first aid kit, another red flag. When they got him calm again, I slapped the map down in front of Dad and pointed to another site. Santa Rosita. That's the Spanish galleon. Dad, he's saying the name of the ship. My dad sank into a chair, wheels on fire in his head. Gordon kept asking him questions, but my dad just kept staring at the floor, working through the possibilities. It was as if something was transmitting a signal to Vadim's brain, triggering his speech. But not his speech. It was the prayer of a dying sailor. It couldn't have been a piece of technology. The galleon was over 500 years old. Whatever it was, something had to have captured, stored, and transmitted it biologically. Finally, he said, It has to be a living organism. Gordon shot him down, saying, There's zero chance. Look. Even if that was a possibility, somebody would have heard it before now. Someone did. Emma Honoré. She heard things down here. Voices from beyond the grave. Dad jumped out of his seat and started pulling out old bins until he found a crate with Emma's original research, audio tapes, and journals from her time on Odessa. There was a cassette player, like the ones I've only seen in old TV shows. And he popped one of the tapes in. He pressed play, and there was her voice. She was in her late 40s by then, but she sounded so much older than her years, mentally and emotionally exhausted. I collapsed in my bunk around 4 a.m., thinking of Alice. She's been gone nearly seven months. Time is inscrutable here. Last night, I did something I haven't done since her funeral. I cried. I finally gave in to the weight of it. And that's when I heard it. It was her voice, clear and present, tactile, like it was coming from inside me rather than outside. She was reciting the last lines of a poem by Rudyard Kipling. She read it to me one night on the deck of the Carabelle, out under the stars. Home they come from all the ports, the living and the dead. 
the good wife's sons come home again, her blessing on their head. In the next recording, Emma laid out the theory that got her drummed out of the scientific community. She imagined a creature that could, essentially, record the sounds of humans and transmit them back to us telepathically. But over time, her theory evolved. That transmission was just the first stage of contact. She came to believe that in the moments of her deepest distress, she had formed a psychic link with something living in the deep, that it could see what she saw and feel what she felt, and vice versa. Hearing this again, my dad was devastated. He'd been her protege. She was like a mother to him. But he reacted just like everybody else. He thought she'd gone crazy. Now, all these years later, he had to admit she might have been right. He wondered, What if the thing we saw in the Dayton was Emma's creature? What if Vadim tapped into that connection when he got hurt, just like Kowalski in The Spanish Sailor? What if... At the point of their deepest distress, they forged that same psychic link. Gordon was skeptical, to say the least, saying, There's no way something like that could exist without us knowing. We've been crisscrossing the oceans for centuries. We would have discovered it by now. But Dad brought up Dr. Honoré's own words about how we have better maps of Mars than we do of our own oceans. Every year, we spend billions of dollars searching for intelligent life in outer space. We don't even spend a fraction of that in the oceans. What if there's something just as mind-blowing right here in our own backyard? It's E.T. Extraterrestrial? No, this is entirely terrestrial. Life on Earth began in the sea, right? Down here is where consciousness was formed. The branch that created us split off some 300 million years ago. We have no idea what else may have been evolving down here since then. Maybe it was smart enough to avoid us and evade detection. Look at the suffering we've caused so many other species. This could change everything. If this thing is trying to communicate with us by sending pre-recorded messages, imagine what could happen if we were able to teach it the meaning of those words. We might actually be able to communicate with another species. A real conversation. You don't really believe that's possible, do you? After what I just saw, I'm suspending my judgment on what's possible and what's not. I know one thing's for sure. I have to get a closer look. I'm going back to the Dayton. I could hear my dad arguing with Gordon through the airlock. Gordon told him he was putting our lives at risk. We have to wait for the umbilical to reboot. We have plenty of air, food, and water. And what if the umbilical doesn't work? If anything, we should be trying to fix Ringo's docking station. We'll have time. You're out of your mind, Evan. You know who you sound like? You sound like Dr. Honoré. Is that what you want? What I want is the truth. While Dad prepped his gear, I repurposed the cockpit and wired a couple of GoPro cameras to act as his eyes and ears on the dive. We each recorded audio messages and strapped a small, portable speaker to his camera. The plan was to get closer and try to communicate with the sound of our voices. Perhaps it would transmit a signal we could pick up with Gertrude. With a visor down and headphones on, I could see and hear everything that my dad was experiencing on his descent to the Dayton. I could hear his measured breaths and found myself syncing up my inhales and exhales with his. I had a flash of a memory. I was a kid taking a nap on his chest, our breathing in sync just like now. I heard the hiss of the regulator and flashed to the future, to mom's hospital room, the two of us holding hands as we listened to the respirator that was keeping her alive long enough for us to say goodbye. I heard his heartbeat and flashed even further ahead to the moments back home, just after her funeral, after everyone left when we didn't have to be strong anymore and finally let down our guard. He held me close to his chest. I remember feeling his heartbeat against my cheek the same heartbeat I was hearing now in my ears. As the stern of the sunken ship came into view again, the memories faded away and I focused on the task at hand. We were all on high alert. Even Gordon and May huddled around the monitor nearby to watch. Inside the wreckage of the Dayton, my dad made his way slowly to the crack in the hull where we'd seen the eye before. My dad clipped the speaker to a jagged piece of metal, then gave me the signal. 
Back at Odessa, I played the audio recording we had made and sent the sound waves traveling through the body of the Dayton. There was a long silence. Dad hovered near the crack in the hull, silent and still. Gradually, a figure began to emerge from the darkness on the other side. I could tell from the eye it was the same one I had seen earlier, but it just kept coming and coming. It was definitely some kind of cephalopod, but it was bigger than any of us had ever seen. It had long, bioluminescent tentacles that glowed in the dark and cast strange, lighted patterns on the walls of the ship. I was getting every second. The creature put its eye to the crack of the hull, inches from my dad's face. I could hear his heart racing, but he fought to keep his breathing calm. He didn't want to do anything to scare it off at this point. He spoke softly. There was a small crackle over the comms, a signal cutting in, and a woman's voice. I recognized her right away. It was like an electrical current running through every cell in my body. That was my mom's voice. The creature was transmitting a conversation my mom and dad had over their scuba comms on a dive years ago. Dad said, That was our honeymoon, the Makaha Caverns in Hawaii. That's thousands of miles away. Five thousand to be exact. Then how? I don't think it's one creature. You mean it's like a network? A super organism. Some creature back then captured my voice. One in a million at sea over 20 years ago. This one recognized me and played it back. Who knows how long this thing has been down here and what else it's recorded. The galleon is 500 years old. What if it's been recording our entire history and passing it down from one creature to the next? If that's true, it could tell us why certain ships went down, where planes disappeared. Emma was right. You know what that means? It means no one's gonna pull my funding now. Dad put a hand up to the crack in the hull and extended his fingers through it. The cephalopod-like creature extended a tentacle, rolling the tip of it slowly toward my dad's hand. It glowed softly in the murky water. And just like that, contact. Nice to meet you too. A few seconds later, the creature slipped away into the darkness. Dad started his journey back. I flipped up the visor of the cockpit to rest my eyes, but noticed that Gordon and May had disappeared. At the time, I couldn't understand what was so important that they would have walked away from what would be considered one of the greatest scientific discoveries in history. It was only later, after weeks of interrogation and reading the reports, that I learned about their conversation in the corridor outside the lab. May pulled Gordon into the airlock to warn him about what would happen when Dad's discovery got out. The mining operation would be shut down. His company would lose tens of billions of dollars. So would her government. Turns out, May wasn't an assistant. She was a Chinese intelligence officer assigned to oversee Gordon and her government's investment in the mine. And there was no way she was letting the news of our discovery get back to the surface. She ordered Gordon to prep Ringo. They were going to launch for the surface soon. Gordon told her that launching Ringo might flood the base and kill us. May told him might wasn't good enough. She was going to make sure we didn't make it out alive. She just needed time to make it look like an accident. While Gordon prepped Ringo for launch, May put the spare oxygen tanks in a corridor leading to the lab and improvised an explosive device to set them off. 
Her plan was for the explosion to breach the lab and flood any of the other corridors that weren't sealed off by airlock. Later, she would claim that the explosion was part of a cascade of accidents following the shockwave. Meanwhile, Dad's oxygen supply wouldn't last long enough to get to the surface. Without support or an extra tank from Odessa, he would suffocate. Dad was halfway back to Odessa when the corridor exploded. I came to on the floor as ice-cold water began to cover my face. I opened my eyes, squinting through the mixture of salt water and blood. I don't know how long I'd been unconscious. A minute, maybe? Two at the most. Enough time for water to begin rushing through a cracked seam in the wall of the lab. Four inches high and rising quickly. Soaked to the bone, I hauled myself up to my feet. My whole body ached. I grabbed the cockpit and tried to make contact with Dad, but the comms had gone dead. I called out for Gordon and May, but there was no answer. The water pouring into the lab was flowing outward to the other modules. I saw the water rising toward Vadim, still laid out on the lab table. I was going to have to move him to another corridor and try to stop the flow of water by sealing off the airlock. Vadim outweighed me by a hundred pounds, so I rigged up a flotation device that I could use to haul his body over the water. Outside the lab, Dad got his bearings when he saw Ringo's headlights arcing up toward the surface. Someone had launched and was making their slow ascent. Using the lights as a guide, Dad made his way back to the moon pool module and climbed inside the wreckage of Odessa base. Because our comms were down, he had no way of knowing if I was on my way back up to safety or still inside the damaged base. He fought his way through flooding corridors to find out. When he found me, we were both freezing and exhausted from fighting the rising water. I got trapped in a crew quarters module, pulling Vadim's body along on the float behind me. I told Dad what happened, that May and Gordon disappeared just before the explosion happened, and he told me about Ringo. That's when it all made sense. They weren't making their way to safety. They were making their escape. Our situation went from bad to worse. The module next door was sealed off by the airlock, and the door was jammed shut. There was a latch that could open it, but the path was blocked by debris. Dad tried a number of times to dive down and loosen the debris, but it was no use. He couldn't reach it, and he couldn't hold his breath long enough to clear it out of the way. The water was up to our chests now and rising faster every minute. My body temperature was falling fast. I was having trouble breathing. I started to panic, and for a split second, I slipped out of consciousness. Then, the strangest thing happened. I had what I've heard other people describe as an out-of-body experience. It was like I was floating above us, perched on the ceiling, looking down at the scene. I could see the whole thing so clearly. Vadim's body, my dad stroking my face, trying to bring me back. I could hear the panic in his voice. Suddenly, I snapped back to consciousness. I looked up and realized it hadn't been an out-of-body experience at all. I had been watching through someone else's eyes. And there, coiled around a pipe near the ceiling, was Rick. That connection Emma talked about. I had felt it with Rick. I told Dad it didn't make sense. He wasn't the same species. Dad said, Maybe it's a holobiont. Groups of different species living and working together in symbiosis. At that moment, I knew what I had to do. I wasn't even halfway through laying out my plan before Dad cut me off. I was asking him to do the impossible. To save us, he was going to have to let me die, or at least come close. If being in a distressed state helps form the psychic connection to the superorganism, I wondered if I could put my body in extreme distress to communicate with Rick. He knew how to use the latch. All I had to do was lead him to it. If Rick could get through the debris and pull the latch, we could get to the observation module that hadn't been flooded. It had to be me. I explained. I already have a bond with him, and you're the only one who knows CPR. You can bring me back, just like you did with Vadim. Sophie, I can't take a chance on losing you. You're not going to, because you're going to bring me back. 
The water was nearing my chin now. We were running out of options. Finally, he agreed. Just before I went under, I had to get something off my chest. I told him, I changed my major to computer science. What? When? Before I left to come here. Why didn't you tell me? Because I didn't want you to be disappointed. Sophie, I don't give a damn what you major in. I want you to do whatever makes you happy. You're not mad about the submersible business? Listen, if we get out of here alive, I may never want to see another submersible again. I took a breath and slipped under the water. I put my hands on the ceiling to stop myself from floating up, and I waited until my lungs ran out of oxygen. I slipped out of consciousness again. The whole world went black for a few moments. When I opened my eyes, I was looking down from above through Rick's eyes. I'd made the connection. In my mind's eye, I pictured the hatch, guiding him to where we needed his help. He loosened our grip on the pipe overhead and we slipped into the water below. Rick jetted us through the debris, squeezing through tight spaces, quickly making our way to the latch. Together, we coiled our tentacles around the debris and cleared it out of the way. Once the latch was clear, we grabbed hold and pulled. Once, twice, three times, harder with every pull. The latch shifted a little at first, then finally, it opened all the way. With only seconds to spare for my dad and Vadim, the airlock door opened to the observation module on the other side. When I came to this time, I was coughing up seawater and gasping for air. Dad was kneeling over me. I could tell from the pressure in my chest he'd been giving me CPR. I was on the floor of the observation module next to Vadim. We made it. The bond I'd formed with Rick saved us from the rising water, but we weren't out of the woods just yet. We were still going to run out of oxygen, and soon. Dad tried to make a distress call, hoping the umbilical hadn't been damaged again in the explosion. Mayday! Mayday! This is Evan Oaks from Odessa Reef Base. Can anyone hear me? But there was only silence. Through the floor-to-ceiling windows, we caught a glimpse of something, a light in the distance. It was Ringo, slowly making its way to the surface, with Gordon and May on board. I could see the fear in my dad's eyes. Then, a flicker of surprise. I followed his gaze out the window. An enormous shadow rose from the depths, rocketing upward, headed straight for the Odessa. From the head to the tip of its tentacles, it was as tall as a two-story house. As it moved closer, its entire body began to glow, the bioluminescence making it appear less like a sea creature and more like some alien mothership. It lit up the whole observation pod and flickered across our faces. I asked what it was doing and my dad said, I think it's here to help. A catamaran five miles away was the first vessel to hear dad's voice coming over its radio, but it didn't stop there. One by one, ships all over the Western Hemisphere, from fishing boats to military craft to ocean liners, begin receiving our distress call, broadcast by the superorganism's invisible network. Back on the Odessa, the radio crackled to life, bringing a chorus of responses. Rescue teams were assembling. Help was on the way. vessel intercepted Gordon and May in the HOV. They were taken into custody and charged with attempted murder. Within hours, we were boarding a different Coast Guard vessel. Vadim was taken to a Manila hospital by helicopter, while Dad and I changed into dry clothes and tried to warm up with bad coffee and only slightly better soup. After that, we were put into separate quarters for questioning, which seemed more like an interrogation. First, the Philippine Coast Guard, then the U.S. Coast Guard, followed by the Navy, the FBI, the CIA, 
then a lady whose division had no name or initials. I tried looking it up afterward, but there's no evidence that it actually exists. The whole incident remained classified until the interested parties figured out what it meant for their countries and the world at large. At the end of my last interrogation, the woman with no official title or department stared at me for a few moments before asking what made me so sure he'd be able to bring me back. I told her, it was never a question. He's my dad. A few days later, we found ourselves in a town called Timber Cove, a couple hours north of San Francisco. We walked a stone path to a little white cottage and knocked on the door. There was no answer, so we circled around the house and took the stairway that led down the bluff to the beach below. We saw her standing at the edge where the ocean meets the land. Her silver hair was pulled back into a ponytail, exposing her weathered face to the sun. She was smaller than I remember from the videos, but there was no mistaking the cobalt eyes turned, as they had been her whole life, toward the sea. Dreaming, searching, it was Dr. Emma Honoré in her natural habitat. She wrapped her arms around my dad and kissed his cheeks and then mine. Her eyes bore holes into my own as she talked about the day I was born how she'd been the third person ever to hold me after mom and dad. She was filled, even now, with an infectious sense of wonder and astonishment over the mysteries of life, how we grow and evolve. Finally, she turned her attention back to dad. What on earth are you doing here? We have something to show you. Over the next several hours, we told Dr. Honoré our story and played her recordings of the transmissions. It was only right that she was the first person to learn the declassified information. We had been back to the side of the Odessa several times by then to reestablish our connection to the creature we discovered there. The mining operations had been put on hold indefinitely. Because the lab was uninhabitable, we worked side by side out of a two-man submersible, collecting new recordings for our presentation. We played one of those recordings for Dr. Honoré. It was her partner, Alice, reciting lines from a poem as she heard those words again, Dr. Honoré's bright blue eyes filled with tears and she clutched Dad's hand. Home they come from all the ports, the living and the dead. The good wife's sons come home again for her blessing on their head. The next place it led was the lecture hall at the International Science Foundation. We stepped on stage to polite applause. The room was filled with scientists from every discipline and press from all over the world. Word had spread that we were about to reveal a historic discovery, one that might shed light on any number of great mysteries from the past. The people in this room had heard those claims before and had often been disappointed. Looking out at the sea of faces, I saw a lot of folded arms and skeptical eyebrows. What happened next is a bit of a blur. I remember the audible gasps when we showed them images of the creature and played clips of the Spanish sailor. I remember the stunned silence as we went even further back in time to play a conversation we'd picked up in ancient Aramaic. I remember their eyes lighting up when Dad talked about the possibility of reviving dead languages of exploring lost cities and the Bermuda Triangle. He ended the presentation with a vision for the future. He was right when he told Gordon that we might one day be able to hold an actual conversation with our creature. It didn't take as long as he thought. After a few days of teaching it the meanings of a small number of words, it was able to form its first simple sentence, patching together sounds from its database of the English language. We were a long way from in-depth discussion, but as my dad explained to the crowd, If we can establish a standard form of communication, we won't have to rely solely on science to understand the effects of pollution or climate change on the sea's inhabitants. We'll hear it straight from the seahorse's mouth, so to speak. And we do well to listen, because it's not just our past that's tied to the ocean. The fate of our species depends on it.
Two hours later, we were sitting on the hood of the car in a parking lot by the beach, eating burgers and fries from in and out There was a ton of food at the reception, but we were so busy talking and shaking hands, we didn't even get a chance to look at it, let alone grab a bite. Dad brushed off his hands, asked if I was sure I didn't want him to drive me back to school. I'll be fine. Do you need me to talk to your professors, or...? I think by tomorrow, they'll understand why I'm coming back late. Yeah, I guess you're right. I told him I'd been thinking. I said I didn't want to major in marine biology. But I was thinking, maybe while I was still in school, I pulled a slip of paper from my back pocket and unfolded it to show him a sketch of the submersible we'd been talking about for years. After tonight, you'll have plenty of investors, and I'd have summers off to work with you. That is, if you can stand to look at another submersible. If we're gonna travel the world looking for lost cities and other weird creatures, we might as well do it in the sub of our dreams. I thought we could name it Maya, after Mom. What do you think? Dad looked out at the ocean and smiled. I think it's perfect. Odessa, written by Mickey Fisher. Cast. Sophie Oakes, read by Hannah Mae Sturgis. Evan and Kowalski, read by Joshua Kobach. Dr. Honoré and Alice, read by Katie Fafel. Gordon and Vadim, read by Jody Shelton. Music and sound created by your Uncle Josh and Mighty Kate. This audiobook was recorded at Leela Records Studio in New York City.